Now our speaker today is David Smith, and we were talking about missionaries this morning in Sabbath school and the uh, Fiwago Orphanage. Hold on just a minute. And I was just wanting to say that uh, we often think of missionaries as people traveling to foreign lands, Kenya, different places, and we've got a missionary right here, um, David. You came and as a missionary to this area last year when the school was in great need and helped out. And then, of course, you know, Satan had his yeah. attempt to try and hurt your family, but the Lord prevailed. And now he's back working uh, at the school uh, with, do you still have a home over on the way on the other side of the country? Yes. Yeah. So he's sacrificing quite a bit and making great progress. I heard you got a greenhouse going. Yeah, it's cool, and we have one going now. Yeah, so I don't yeah. want to take about whatever you're talking about, but uh, okay. just uh, it's exciting the things that the Lord is doing, amen? amen. And uh, I know we'll be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in Sabbath school, it was mentioned that we should pray without ceasing. So let's pray. Father, again, it is a privilege to be here. This is your throne room. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here to learn about you. Lord, as we open your holy word today and, and look at some ideas and some passages, I pray that you will open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, I pray that we will be moved to be witnesses for you. Lord, this was your message. I'm just the messenger to your honor, and to your glory. Amen. Well, again, I would like to uh, welcome you to church today. Um, I always really enjoy coming up here to Kettle Falls. Um, I find your church to be so peaceful, and I, I like that. After a hectic day or a hectic week at school, I know we're not in school now, but I'm already working at school, it's nice for quiet. The Lord is there. It's the quiet voice. And I appreciate that. I would like to give a special welcome. Um, Elder Quaid, you mentioned uh, being from back east. Yes, I came from back east. I actually have responded to the call here in Colville twice now. Um, great need both times. I'm guessing I probably should stay put instead of keep going back, but uh, um, I really enjoy being here. I really enjoy being here, but I did want to extend a special welcome uh, to my wife back in Maryland, and also I have a number of family members watching today, my wife's watching, uh, along the East Coast, and especially I want to give a warm welcome to my little niece, London. She's only about this tall, but uh, she's watching. In London, I want you to pay attention today, okay? Um, I need a favor, and I want you to listen carefully. If you are under the age of 18, I need you to come up here to the platform. I'm going to have you take a look into my cooler and I want you to try to figure out what's in the cooler, okay? So don't be shy like I am. Um, if you're under the age of 18, please, please come up and take a look. What is it? think that is that's kind of strange isn't it you look puzzled yeah okay well we're going to find out what this is momentarily okay so you guys try to remember what you saw you can go back and sit down now okay
clear back as I could remember. Um, yeah, and, and feel free to share with the, your parents and everybody else what you think it is that you saw. It's a very strange thing, trust me. Um, but as far back as I can remember, I have loved history, particularly biblical history. Um, it just, to me, there's so much in this book you know, don't ever let anybody tell you that the Bible is boring and there's nothing in there. Anything you want in life, you can find in that book. And uh, I, I remember one summer as a kid, I think I was just going into fifth, sixth, or seventh grade, but I became very interested in the story of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. And that really turned me on to studying ancient Egypt. And I remember just as that age that I wanted to become an Egyptologist to study ancient Egypt. I was even learning, you know, hieroglyphics and, you know, all this stuff. These are things that Moses would have been learning and knew um, as he was in, in, in Egypt. And uh, that interest uh, in Egyptology I've carried with me um, throughout my career. And back in 2007, I was hired to be the principal and the nine and 10 homeroom teacher at a larger junior academy uh, in the Midwest. And I remember arriving um, at that school probably uh, sometime early June, and I got into my classroom, and I started to think about the school year and started doing some planning for the school year. And with ninth and 10th grade classes in a junior academy, you kind of have a rotation of doing classes. Like one year you'll do algebra, the next year you'll do geometry. One year you'll do biology, the next year you do general science, one year you do world history, the next year geography. And this particular year, it was the year for world history. Well, I was like, bingo, I love history. And it also was the year for teaching biology. So I, I remember sitting at the teacher's desk leaning back in my chair, trying to think of something that I could do to tie together world history, biology, and the Bible together throughout the school year. And I came up with a, a, pretty, cool, uh, a pretty cool idea. Um, I started to think, you know, when we get to the section about Egypt or ancient Egypt, I want to tie that in as much as I can with the biblical account, with Moses, the Exodus, and, and everything, um, and try to make that a little bit more real for the kids. And uh, I started to do quite a bit of research for something unique that I could do. And uh, I started to formulate some ideas, and I happened to talk to a, a good friend of mine that was also a teacher, and she was telling me that something they did in their classroom and um, I was like, you know, Mr. Smith's a little bit quirky, but that's right up my alley. I gotta try that. And uh, so I decided to do something. And this is the object those young people saw when they came up here. I decided to mummify a chicken. This is a chicken, okay? When I first got this chicken, I, hey, I know I'm strange, but this is cool, okay? Um, the first day that I had this chicken in the classroom, I remember putting on a pair of rubber gloves, and I could put this big hand completely up inside that chicken. And I remember walking around the classroom teaching history that day with a chicken on my hand. And uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to teach the students not only about history, but Mr. Smith always has something else in mind. There was some place I was going with this. So I remember that first day I explained, you know, each of us are going to take turns working with this chicken every day until it's mummified. And the way we did that is I had to invest in a lot of salt. I'm gonna tell you, it's a lot of salt, okay? And the one thing that I neglected to do with this whole project and experiment was to keep track of how many containers of salt I used. 
I am sure that it's literally hundreds and hundreds of containers of salt. So I remember that first day, we took the chicken, I took my hand out of it, and we poured salt inside the chicken, the body cavity. We put the chicken upside down in a bucket, and we poured salt all around the chicken so it was completely covered, okay? And the process you go through is for the first week or two, you have to change the salt every day. And it's probably a good thing that we're talking about this next part here rather than a potluck because the grossness that came out of that chicken was disgusting, okay? Um, but it was interesting. Right away, you could see a change happening to that chicken. There was something happening to that chicken. It started to dry out, and it started to get smaller, okay? Um, I remember one Sunday morning going early to the Walmart store, and I had a grocery cart, and it was about half full of salt. And I went up to the cash register. It's the only thing I had in the cart. I went up to the cash register, and uh, I started to put the salt on the conveyor belt, and the clerk stopped and looked at me. It's like, you really must like salt. <laughs> and I said, um, well, not exactly. And I explained the whole process. And uh, it's funny when you can say something and somebody is speechless. They, she didn't know what to say. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but uh, as the year progressed, um, the chicken got to the point there wasn't any smell to it. You couldn't smell it. It wasn't rotting. It wasn't fermenting. It wasn't decaying. Uh, the junior academy I taught at, we had a large um, steam boiler, and those uh, steam pipes were going to all the classrooms. Uh, the floor in my classroom actually had pipes going through it. So my room was always toasty. But we decided after a while that we really wanted to speed up drying this chicken out. So we took it and put it on one of the pipes in the furnace room, and man, that's when it really started to dry out. And then after a while, we took the chicken out and we would have it sitting on the register in our classroom. It's very strange, my superintendent coming in and seeing a chicken sitting on the register. Um, but it continued to dry out. And uh, I did some research into what the Egyptians used to cover up the odor of a dead body. And uh, have you ever heard of anything called cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg? Okay, those were things that they used to help take the smell away. So we got to a point that I mixed up a bunch of those spices and we put it inside the body cavity of the chicken. And then one Sunday, I went up and I spent a good portion of the morning wrapping gauze around the chicken and then treating it with a uh, polyurethane just to help seal it. And then when the, my students came in on Monday morning, here's the chicken all wrapped up sitting there like this on my desk. And um, they decided that uh, in line with their studies with ancient Egypt that they would name this. This little guy is called Chickatut. And uh, you know, a lot of people have skeletons in their closet. Well, I have a mummified chicken in my dresser, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very well preserved. It was started being preserved in 2007, and it, it's still, you can still smell the spices, and um, it, it was just a very interesting project. And at this point, it was time for me to ask the students, well, what did you learn? Okay, this is getting into second semester of the school year. And, uh, you know, they talked about, you know, what salt had done and, you know, the grossness that came out of the chicken and I don't know if I want to eat chicken anymore and, you know, just, just all kinds of things as teenagers are, you know, quite creative people. So they got through their discussion and I said, okay, but what about a spiritual application? You know, what did you learn spiritually? And they kind of sat and thought for a bit and, you know, we had a little bit of a discussion and that's 
kind of what led me here this morning, this whole idea of salt. And I want to go back and look at our scripture with you this morning. Luke chapter 14, 34 and 35. You can't pray enough and you can't read in the Bible enough. And uh, I encourage you to spend as much time as you can doing both. Luke 14, 34 and 35. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath hath ears to hear, let him hear. And there's something that has always completely fascinated me. Um, Mrs. Quaid and Elder Meloshenko, you both shared some ideas with your portions of the Sabbath school this morning that dovetail precisely in with the thoughts I wanted to share. And I tend to be a very careful planner, but no human could ever plan that that's going to happen. You know, it's just the Lord doing his work. And uh, it just forever amazes me. I don't want to say amuses, because it doesn't amuse me. It's just like, well, he did it again. And uh, that's, that's just very cool. Um, during the discussion that I had with my ninth and 10th graders about what we use salt for, they came up with some, some good ideas. And I had to go back and review a little bit. I have a good memory, but it's getting shorter the older I get. And I had to go back, I don't know if anybody else is that way too, just me, right? I had to go back and look at, uh, you know, what, what is this thing, salt? You know, people use salt for everything. And, um, you know, salt was used for money once upon a time. You know, someone was worth their salt uh, because people place such a high value on salt. Salt was used to cure and store meat. Salt was used and can be used to disinfect wounds. Salt can be used to gargle with when you have a sore throat. My wife is forever having me do that. Salt can also be mixed, uh, a special mixture when you make pottery, and it helps make an extremely hard glaze on pottery. Salt obviously helps food taste better, and I actually don't add salt to anything. Okay, and that's, that's the way I've always been. Um, I remember growing up, my mom would always season whatever she was cooking with salt, but my dad always had a salt shaker right in front of his plate, and he would add more salt. I, I didn't add salt to anything. And um, in June, when I went back east to uh, spend some time with, with my wife, um, she was doing some cooking uh, in the kitchen, one of my favorite meals that she makes. It's lentils, rice, and uh, steamed vegetables. And uh, to her, she added a pinch of salt to the lentils. To me, she may as well just used a shovel. And I was like, um, sweetie, this is, uh, this is pretty salty. She goes, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot. So she made that again just before I came back, and it was just perfect. And the second batch, I mean, I ate the first batch. It's, it's so delicious. But the second batch, we sat and talked about seasoning and salt in cooking how it actually will bring out the flavor of what it's added to. And uh, I don't know, maybe I need to start adding salt to th so things are more tasty. But salt is quite distinctive, and it's totally different. It's a totally different compound from the food or whatever it's added to. It's completely different. But it's kind of like it makes just something so much better. Salt helps t uh, food taste better, uh, salt can also make us sick. If you have too much salt, you can get sick. If you drink salt water, you can get sick. Um, I remember um, living in Hawaii for a year, getting into boogie boarding, getting caught on the bottom of a wave once in a while, going straight to the bottom and coming up just spitting and gagging salt water. Uh, it's not a, not a fun experience. Uh, salt can be used to help melt ice and snow on our roads and sidewalks. Salt will change whatever it comes into contact with. It can change the taste, texture, and tenderness of meat. Um, 
The Bible also talks about salt a number of times, too. We read about a city of salt, a valley of salt. Moses refers to the salt sea. There were the salt pits. Animal sacrifices in the temple were seasoned with salt. Covenants were made and ratified with salt. Elisha cast salt into a pool of water to purify it. Salt could also be used to render land infertile. Abimelech raised Shechem, and then he sowed salt over the top of it so it couldn't be used. Salt was used in antiquity for preservation of food before there was re uh, refrigeration and freezing. Salt at that time came from the Dead Sea and was actually stored in special chambers for salt at the temple, and it was given with sacrifices by the priest. Salt was not brought to the temple by the worshipers, but it was provided for at the temple. Salt was the most commonly used seasoning in antiquity because humans weren't quite familiar with Tabasco and everything else yet. So salt is a good thing. One tiny little bit of salt can diffuse its flavor far and wide. Just like light overcomes darkness, so salt overcomes blandness. Salt must be dispersed or it is a worthless heap of nothing. The power of salt lies in its difference. Salt is distinctive. True believers, true Christians, and dare I say, true Adventists need to be distinctive. We are to be different from the world and we need to be much different than the world. As Christ's disciples, we are called to be the salt of the earth, so we are called to be salty. Now, coming from back east, if somebody says somebody's salty, you have to be real careful with that, okay? The slang definition for somebody being salty means somebody that's angry, irritated, hostile, upset, and bitter, or they use crude language. And we don't want to be that kind of salty, okay? And uh, coming from Maryland, uh, we actually live just, I don't know, probably a mile or two uh, from Chesapeake Bay. And uh, you see vehicles all the time that have decals on them that say salt life. So they're advertising the fact that they apparently are from the Chesapeake Bay area from the East Coast, that part of the East Coast. So you're able to identify them right away. Let me ask you this morning, if people look at us, if they look at you, shouldn't they notice something different about us? Okay. Shouldn't they get curious about the Lord that we believe in, the Lord we serve? Um, do people, when they look at us, do they see our saltiness? Do they understand we have salt to share? You know, just something to think about. I do a lot of reading, and... Uh, one of the people that I have done a lot of reading about is Martin Luther. And uh, I look forward to meeting Martin Luther in heaven. But he said once that a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. How is it with us? Are we giving something? Are we spending of our means, our time, and ourselves for our Lord? Are we suffering for our Lord and his cause? Are we having a positive impact on the world around us? Ask yourselves, are we actually making a difference for the Lord? Now, when I study the Bible, when I prepare you know, for a message that the Lord is directing me to, to present, when I prepare for a Sabbath school, when I prepare for Bible classes in school, a lot of times I will have numerous versions of the Bible spread out because I like to compare what Bibles, different versions of the Bible or different writers have to say because to me that helps me get a, a clearer picture. It's par probably part of the English major in me. But I wanted to look at another verse in the Bible this morning. It's Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Romans chapter 12, 
in verse 2. Now, the particular Bible I used for, for this uh, verse was the Living Bible, because I really liked the way it, it pulled the, the verse together um, and the message that it gave. So Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your experience how his ways will really satisfy you. You see, we're not to be conformed to the world, but we're here to work to help the change, help make a change for the better in the world. Our positive Christian influence should have a positive impact for the Lord. The reason that the Lord has called us to be salt is that salt makes a difference. Salt changes whatever it comes into contact with. And Jesus didn't call us so that we could just sit comfortably around in a salt pile or sit safely inside the salt shaker and simply wait comfortably to go to heaven. Jesus called us to actually make a positive difference in the world spreading his good news to those around us. The world should never influence us, but we should be able to influence the world for good. Um, toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he takes time to pray a special prayer for his disciples. And I'd like you to turn to John chapter 17. We're not going to look at the entire chapter. Maybe that could be my homework for you guys. I like to give homework. Read through John chapter 17 this afternoon just to get an idea. But I wanted to look at John 17 verses 13 through 18. And again, I'm reading this out of the uh, Living Bible. John 17, 13 through 18. <clears throat> And now I am coming to you. I have told them many things while I was with them, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your commands. And the world hates them because they don't fit in with it, just as I don't. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from Satan's power. They are not part of this world any more than I am. Make them pure and holy through teaching them your words of truth. As you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. I consecrate myself to meet their need for growth in truth and holiness. You know, being a Christian is not a spectator sport. It is not a spectator sport. We, as Christians, we cannot be sitting safely on the sidelines. We can't just be enjoying the action that everybody else is doing. And we can't be oblivious to what's going on. We actually need to be actively involved. You know, after all, God's hands have human fingerprints. God wants to touch the world, and he's using us to do that. He's working with his spirit on people to be witnesses for him. So we need to be involved. He wants us to be involved. And we're literally right at the end of the earth's history. I feel the Lord is returning very soon. Very soon. And we're being called to be active Christians on his behalf. We need to be involved spreading salt. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5.20, that now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. So we're being called to be ambassadors, and ambassadors are representative. You know, our nation's ambassadors, they get commissioned, they go and live in a foreign country on foreign soil for a time to represent our nation. We've been called as Christians to be ambassadors to live on this foreign soil because we're destined for heaven, okay? 
And we need to share our belief. We need to share our witness with other people, with other uh, people who are unbelievers. The Lord expects us to represent him in a loving way. We're not, to be, we're not sent to be judges. We're not sent to be critical. We're not sent to act as the Pharisees did of old. Okay? We are to show kindness of God, and that will bring men and women to repentance. We've come to represent the Father's love and kindness and mercy for Jesus to the world around us. Like any good ambassador, we want to represent the mercy and grace of our King by reflecting the light of Christ. And in so doing, we hope to attract the unbelievers to Christ. You know, and uh, as Christians, we aren't called to restrict our associations in the world to only Christians or sinless people. If that's what the Lord wanted us to do, um, we probably wouldn't have any friends at all. You know, look at the world around you. We were put here for a reason. Each of us is here for a specific reason. And, uh, you know, working with children and students every day in a classroom, I know what my purpose and my reason is. That's to share my witness with these young people, and they in turn are going to go and share. And that's so rewarding for me to see that. A lot of my um, former uh, students are now teachers. There's some pastors. There's one that went on to the GC for a little bit. Um, but we never know how far our influence or our words or our witness are going to travel. The Lord's going to bless the work that we do for him. It's not to bring any attention to us. It's to direct all attention to Jesus Christ. You know, there's been some feelings or thoughts throughout the history of uh, Christianity that the Christian church is a salt factory and that the world is the marketplace for our salt. But far too much salt is being stored and locked up in the church, and there's actually not enough salt making it out into the world's marketplace. Perhaps it's more comfortable to stay in the salt shaker or stay safe and secure in the salt pile. But the sure result of that way of thinking is simply this. The world is not going to be salted and it's not going to be flavored enough for Jesus Christ. Salt has the capacity again to change anything it comes into contact with, but the key is that it has to come in contact, contact with something for there to be a result. Um, the great Episcopalian bishop, the late Samuel Shoemaker, summed up the situation this way. He says, in the great gospel commission, the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of men, but we've turned the great commission around so that we have become merely keepers of the aquarium. So, we are to salt the earth and not assault it. We are to affect the planet, not infect it. We are to be a positive changing force for the Lord, not a negative force. We are to be good for the earth and not bad for it. Our great commission is to change the world for Christ, not to change it against him. We are to be leading people to Christ and not driving them away. We are to be working for Christ and not working against him. We are to be using our talents, gifts, abilities, time, and resources to be about our Father's business. We are called to be the salt of the earth. When I was uh, back east in June, I loved to read, so I had to pick up a, a new history book. I picked up a great big thick volume on Thomas Edison. And I'm enjoying reading through the book. It's a fascinating book. And uh, when I was preparing these thoughts uh, to share with you this morning, I came to the section of the book where there's, uh, 
it's recorded what a number of people said when Thomas Edison passed away. And one of the people mentioned in the book was President Herbert Hoover. President Hoover was moved to eloquence and said this of Thomas Edison, he multiplied light and dissolved darkness. Think about that. Multiplying light and dissolving darkness, that's what we're asked to do as Christians too. We're asked to multiply the light, capital L on light, and dissolve the darkness around us. We as Christians are to multiply Jesus' light and to dissolve the darkness of sin in our world. Our salt must be spread, it must penetrate. You know, uh, frequently people sit around a table and you're gonna hear, hear them say as they share a meal, please pass the salt. We need to pass the salt. We need to get salty, the correct definition of salty. We need to be the light of the world. We need to pass the salt. You know, thinking back to those lonely, dark hills outside of Bethlehem so many years ago, those shepherds, once they heard what they heard, and once they saw what they saw of baby Jesus, they immediately went out and told people about it. They immediately started to spread salt. And that's exactly what we need to do. You know, Jesus says that we are to let our light shine before men. We don't hide it under a bushel. So don't hide your salt. Don't use your salt sparingly. Get crazy and wild. Share your salt. If we hide our salt, we hide the joy and blessings of being a Christian. It's always, again, something that fascinates me. When I work in a classroom with students, particularly in Bible class, when you see that light bulb come on and a student understands the concept you know, from the Bible, that's, that's amazing. You know, it, there's, there's great joy in doing that, to be able to share with somebody and you see them understand, you see them put that into practice, that's awesome. I wanted to share a story with you this morning. Um, again, I, I like history, so this is going back in history a little bit. During the Middle Ages, there once was a famous king who became burdened, discouraged, and depressed by all that he had to do and with the overwhelming circumstances and many demands upon him in his realm. He felt that he had been rejected by many of his subjects and his spirits continued to get lower and lower by the day. So one day he called for his three beautiful daughters to come and comfort and reassure him as only a daughter can do. The three daughters sat and visited with their father, the king, for a while, and he finally asked them how much they loved him. The oldest daughters, the two oldest daughters, quickly answered their father, the king, and assured him that they loved him more than all the silver and gold in the whole world. Well, the king really liked that answer because it was something he could easily understand. The king then turned to his youngest daughter and sat looking at her. She was sitting quietly watching him. After a few minutes, the king impatiently says to her, Well, my dear, what about you? How much do you love me? His youngest daughter sat intently watching her father and thought for a while longer and then quietly replied, Father, I love you like salt. The king's face fell. He looked completely puzzled. Needless to say, the king was not pleased with that answer, and a dark scowl came over his face. The king considered salt to be of very little value and couldn't understand how his youngest daughter 
could say something so terrible and unfeeling to him, the king rose from his throne and stormed out of the royal hall. The king's cook, who, as usual, had been standing off to the side, happened to overhear the complete conversation. A sly grin came over the cook's face as she realized that the youngest daughter's reply had far more significance than her father the king imagined. The cook dared not speak to the monarch about this matter, but devised a very subtle way to emphasize the true meaning and import of the young girl's words. The next morning at breakfast, the cook withheld all the salt from everything that was served to the king and his guests at the royal table. The meal was so insipid that the king and his many important guests did not enjoy it at all, for the meal was completely inedible. As the king sat angrily at the table, he suddenly remembered his conversation with his daughters the day before. It was then that he realized the full force and meaning of his youngest daughter's answer to him. He realized that his youngest daughter loved him so much that nothing was good without him. He was more important than anything else to his young daughter. Upon having this epiphany in the presence of all his important guests in the royal hall that day, the king turned to his youngest daughter and quietly said to her, I understand now, Mary, your love for me is the greatest of all. Thank you. You know, we too must share God's love with the world for his love is the greatest of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's true love. In closing, um, I wouldn't be a good teacher if I didn't ask questions. So in closing, I have some questions for you. You don't need to answer these out loud. You don't need to write down the answers. I just want you to think about them. So what about you, my friend? If you look at yourself at this very moment in time, do you see a salty Christian? Are you passing the salt? Or are you enjoying lounging around in the salt pile? Are you uncomfortable enough in the salt shaker that you have stepped out into the world to spread saltiness? Are you working to cleanse, preserve, and positively impact the world around you? Are you working to multiply light and dissolve darkness? Are you taking care to be a positive influence and to have a positive impact on the world around you for the Lord. Will our Father say of you one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Do you actually take your saltiness as a Christian seriously? My friend, are you being a salty Christian? <laughs>